Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us at Narrative Science in Techno Environments. So I need to begin by making some very important thank yous. First, the most important sponsor for these two days is the British Academy, which is funding this workshop and some smaller events to follow, thanks to a leadership award I won earlier this year. Next, I should thank the European Research Council, which is providing uh, full funding for my research fellowship here at the LSE on the Narrative Science Project. I'm, of course, therefore very grateful to the PI of the project, Professor Mary Morgan, not only for her continued guidance, feedback and encouragement, but also her assistance in pursuing the British Academy Award as my sponsor. Next, this event is also organised uh, in collaboration with the British Society for the History of Science and the British Society for Literature and Science, two overlapping and interrelated communities that this meeting can bring into closer contact. Last but by no means least, my thanks go to John Lidwell Dernan, who has not only provided support throughout organising this workshop, but also suggested that we try and find ways to create an event like this in the first place. Without John's interest and enthusiasm, this workshop wouldn't be happening. He'll be speaking later today and has also organised an event which is twinned with this one to take place in Oxford on Saturday, which I'll let him tell you about later. The aim of this workshop, and one reason why we are recording so much of it, is to try and build up a network of people interested in intersections between the history of science, technology and engineering on the one hand, and environmental history and humanities on the other. Now there are already a range of scholars building up this interdisciplinary space, and we're lucky to have a few of them joining us over these two days. There is also a whole community of scholars working through the Envirotech network, who I hope will be interested in what we are getting up to. With this workshop, I'm hoping to further interdisciplinary conversations through a shared interest in and commitment to narrative. I'll use my introduction to explain more about the wider narrative science project that this meeting is related to before coming to my own particular line of work in environmental history. So this project is a group of historians and philosophers of science based in London, dedicated to exploring the variety of roles played by narrative in the sciences and engineering through historical and contemporary cases. Some members of the team focus on geological sciences, others chemistry, psychiatry, economics, biology, and we have a wider international network of scholars who look at many other fields. I want to take a couple of minutes to explain further aspects of our project, not because I need everyone here to agree that this is what we're all interested in. Indeed, I want to tell you more about it because some of you might not heard, have heard much about the project at all. I also think the potential that narrative science holds for wider historiography of the environment and beyond might otherwise be overlooked. Narrative science is something people can be inclined to consider only briefly, perhaps because it seems too obvious or already catered for. I should also say that different members of the project explain the project slightly differently, so please don't take me to be speaking for everyone. The first thing to explain is that we are interested in how narrative and narratives either constitute or contribute to knowledge making. There are many scholars who have already attended to narratives importance in the rhetoric of science and in scientific pedagogy and in science communication. While those areas are important, they are already being catered for. So we're looking for narrative at work in science in more particular ways, those ways being at the core of knowledge making. Typically then we are looking at the uses of, appeals to and reliance on narrative within communities of shared expertise. Those times when an expert or scientist is trying to convince a member of their community of the significance of their results, or when they're trying to make sense of their results, and so on. The second thing to explain is that we are interested in how narrative has been understood by scholars in a range of fields, the most obvious being literary studies and narratology, but also those other disciplines that have argued about how narrative works and why, such as cognitive science, film theory, and art history. All of these fields have something different to contribute to an understanding of what narratives are, how they work, and therefore where we might find them in the sciences. The third and last thing I'll explain is that we're interested in narrative rather than something synonymous with a general sense of story. Stories can, of course, be very significant and important, but the structures and argumentative strategies that a narrative relies on or makes available, these are the kinds of things we're particularly interested in. There is, after all, already a whole field dedicated to literature and science. Keeping our view lean in this way helps keep us focused on the kinds of epistemic function that scientists can complete with narrative, be it in their modelling, drawings, other representations, or their designs of experiments, their talks and publications, and so on. 
That's all I'm going to say about the overall project. And if you're intrigued, please do visit the website where you can find a link to a 2017 special issue edited by Mary Morgan and M. Norton Wise. And you can also sign up to our mailing list. So let's get back to this workshop in particular. This is the particular integrative space that I'd like to help populate through this workshop. As I mentioned at the beginning, there is already important and interdisciplinary work going on throughout these areas of interest. My hope is that an attention to narrative simply provides new motivations for travel in both directions. For instance, if we had to pick some important representative works that explicitly look across these two fields, we could consider these recent publications. Uh, on that side of the screen, John Agar's edited collection with Jacob Ward. This collection continues to provide much of the foundation underlying my thinking through environmental history, as I'll come to you again later. On this side is another edited collection from Jody Frawley and Ian McCalman. My reason for choosing this book as an exemplar for the environmental humanities, rather than one of the two or three handbooks on environmental history and humanities that now exist, is thanks to a particular affinity for the subject of ecological invasion, which I'll also say more about later. I also have an admiration for the breadth of the cultural analyses of environmental history contained within this collection. What are the supposed benefits of pursuing narrative together like this? Here's what I think a shared attention to narrative can achieve for these two groups, aside from simply promoting interdisciplinary discussion. For historians of science and technology in particular, narrative offers new kinds of epistemology to look for. For instance, what roles has narrative played in the history of climate modelling, uh, the history of environmental planning, engineering and development, in ecology, botany, entomology and so on, in the design and development of new technologies of use in the field, for engineering the environment and for its management and control. Second, attention to convergent and divergent uses of narrative knowledge provides new ways to look across sciences or industries. How is narrative knowing and making present in wildlife conservation, regulation, and commodification all at the same time? How does environmental forecasting rely on a mix of different sources, geological, agricultural, geophysical, to produce something more coherent? And to what extent are these histories therefore intertwined through the use of these narrative connections? Moving over to environmental history and humanities, the Narrative Science Project takes this expertise in understanding narrative beyond literature to find narrative operating as a way to order and organise one's information or perform some other kind of epistemic function. Adeline Buckland's attention to the place of literary argument within the development of a science of geology in the 19th century is a key case we can think with here. Geology did not become a wholly literary endeavour, rather aspects of literary thinking were constitutive of the science. So too with narrative knowing in other sciences of environment. Second, treating narrative in these ways helps to provide an answer to those people who want to dismiss narrative as not really knowledge at all. There are some people out there giving narrative a bad name, for whom the narrative is basically a fancy way of making things up to capture a wider public imagination. Bringing our scholarship to wider publics is a fundamental concern, and being clear about how narrative is most definitely a form of knowledge making, and that narratives can be more or less well made, subject to testing and shown to fail, is one way we can progress environmental, political and policy discussions without having to engage in post-truth talk. So that's the kind of thing in my head. What about all of you? Over the next two days, we'll get to hear from this wonderful spread of people who have been pursuing the intersections of the history of science and technology, environmental history and narrative, all in their own ways. It's wonderful to have them all here, and I was very happy indeed with the range of issues that they're going to be able to address. We're going to cover themes and topics ranging from flooding to the tropics, from bureaucracy to toxicity, from queer birds to quantum eco-poetic words, from microbial ecologies to Cold War agricultural museologies, from migrating knotweed to botanies of knotweeds, from colonial electrification to plant breeding and mutation, from the cinema of conservation to the sciences of mountain exploration, from human and animal sexual natures to solar power, sugared air, burnt ecologies, and mountainous warfare. Not to mention the three talks I could not rhyme. And to be honest, I'd quite like to leave things here, but having laid out the larger space and seeing as you're all here, I also want to briefly share the particular line of work that's motivating me to organize events like this. 
So my discussion here picks back up on the two edited collections I referenced earlier. So John Agar's introduction to the intersection of histories of technology and environment sets up a number of challenges I'm facing in my particular line of research, which concerns the history of biological engineering. John lists eight ways in which histories of technology and the environment can be implicated in each other. And I'm going to include that list because biological engineering runs right through the middle of all of them. First, the environment as an input into a technological system. Second, the environment as something natural made into or a component with a technological system. Third, the environment as something changed, usually damaged by outputs of technological processes. Fourth, the environment as something alongside an artificial world. Fifth, the environment as something untouched by artifice. Sixth, the environment as something represented through technology. Seventh, environmental knowledge as something organized by being registered with technology and eighth, environment and technologies as interconnected cultural imaginaries. Biological engineering provides very direct and ready examples for each of these. Biologically engineered organisms and materials provide many examples of inputs to technological systems. The converting of starting materials derived from the environment into larger systems happens in many areas of chemical and biological engineering. Researchers and analysts have been motivated by concerns about the damage that new biologically engineered substances might do. Artificiality and naturalness are a key semiotic currency for biological engineering, as is the idea of leaving nature untouched by artifice. Biological engineers also rely on finding new ways to report what is going on in their fields, fermenters and laboratories, technology providing some of the main apparatus. And of course, cultural and political imaginaries of biological engineering are in dialogue with those of environments and society's relationships to the same. So I appreciate that John's book is still pretty new, but we have had the Envirotech network for a long time before this, and yet we do not have an environmental history that takes modified organisms as a focus of interest. Plenty of anthropology, social science, geography, and agricultural history, all of which can be um, interpreted as contributing to environmental history, but nothing that I think tries to directly unpack the relations between biologically engineered organisms, those that came before, and the others that they share the planet with. The majority of environmental histories either ignore organisms that have been subject to modification or molecular intervention, or treat them as only interesting because of the pesticides and other chemicals that they are bundled with, or treat them in technologically deterministic ways, or as signs of the times, often just mentioning them as a controversial topic that does require the attention of environmental historians. The implication is that such objects have not yet belonged in environmental history, which seems strange. So I'm pl planning on improving this situation in two ways, both drawing on literary studies. First, most of the responses to biological engineering that I just listed are responses I would like to be able to analyze historically rather than have to adopt as part of my analysis. When and why organisms come to be viewed as not belonging somewhere or as technology or outside of nature and so on, these are things I want to analyze. Such an approach to biological engineering is fairly straightforward in those areas of environmental history that are already closely engaged with the history of science and technology. But other areas of the environmental humanities do seem to rely quite heavily on appeals to untouched spaces and organisms. Robert Budd, who's joined us today, has made inroads that I think can help us here. He's already argued in work historicizing the concept of applied science that historians of science would do well to learn from those in literary studies who have developed an understanding of the public sphere, such as Mikhail Bakhtin, whose work I'm only just beginning to look at thanks to Robert's suggestion. Nevertheless, understanding the public sphere, the many layers of law and folklore surrounding modified organisms, through these literary approaches, could help produce an environmental history of biological engineering. Second, and now with the other edited collection on ecological invasions in mind, sometimes biological engineering is precisely about the release of modified or sterilized or otherwise altered organisms into new environments for the purposes of biological control. The authors in that collection provide excellent rich accounts of new ways to understand ecological change following the introduction, deliberate or by accident, of species into ecological environments they had otherwise not occupied. But again, none of these authors discuss biologically engineered organisms, apart from, that is, a chapter on the work of Margaret Atwood. I'm intent on bringing literary analysis into the field. Here are the kinds of narrative knowledge necessary to produce an account of a field site, incorporating the insights of field managers, ecologists, entomologists, statisticians, and molecular biologists, motivate my decision to bring you all here today. I'm looking forward to learning from you all. Thank you.